I really want to thank uh, Professor Baker, Professor Bumiller, and all of the people here who helped to organize this, but uh, of course most of all for, uh, I want to thank all of you for being here, for caring about this subject enough to give up your beautiful, this is a rather nice Saturday to, uh, <laughs> to give up to sit in a classroom all day when you didn't need to. So uh, on behalf of all of us who are who presented this and helped organize it. I want to say thank you for, for being here. It was interesting to me that when I started out this morning, I gave three examples or three categories I thought were uh, sort of key to this intersectionality of violence against women and reproductive justice. And um, I found it fascinating that most of our panelists and workshops focused on the third one. There wasn't a lot of talk really about access to uh, emergency contraception after a rape, even though that's been attacked. Not a lot of talk about access to uh, abortion to prevent a pregnancy as a result of rape. I think maybe that's because uh, despite uh, Todd Aiken and uh, some of his cohorts, we really are all in agreement on that and we sort of understand why that's important. The second one was uh, reproductive coercion, something that we've seen that's so frequent in the context of intimate partner violence, particularly among younger relationships, the poking the hole in the condom and or the flushing the pills down the toilet and that kind of thing, either to to force her to have a baby, which is usually what it is, but or and sometimes it's to uh, make sure that she doesn't, to force her into having an abortion. but. The, the third one, which is where, um, and, and there are probably six or ten, but the third one, sort of that the overarching theme that I think most of the discussions fell into was the concept that both domestic violence and reproductive justice are a violation of women's autonomy. And it goes back to the, the quote on the front page of the, um, of the brochure about the seminar, the quote from, uh, from Irene Weiser. And that, that, I think, is where most of us focused. Um, Candace Gibson, who was the first person to speak uh, from the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, talked about the, the really shocking treatment of immigrants, and immigrant women in particular, in detention centers. And, uh, and probably as, as even, <laughs> perhaps as disturbing, the profit motive that has led to the ridiculous proliferation of these kinds of centers and the centering of that detention in uh, places of incarceration so that even women who haven't committed uh, a criminal act other than their presence here in this country or overstaying their student visa or something um, are in fact uh, you know incarcerated in a way that is really shocking and the the two areas that she focused on were the uh, denial of due process and the denial of health care, both of which have a really appalling impact. Um, Sophie Godley was the next speaker, and she's the one that broke the F-bomb barrier, for those of you who were not here this morning and made everybody relax. Um, Sophie, uh, Sophie talked about all, all kinds of, of different issues, but she particularly focused on sex education and the impact of sex education or the lack thereof or some of the ridiculousness of the sex education that we've seen around the country. And her term um, that geography is destiny uh, kind of sort of stuck with me in terms of sex education and whatever kind of community you're in or grow up in has a whole lot to do with how you're taught sex education and what you learn and what you uh, what you take away from that. And, um, and most importantly, uh, she added to my reading list and, uh, and her stories of uh, the, the vaginas on the shelf that women didn't recognize took me all the way back to 1974 and the disposable speculums and the mirrors that we all oh. were required to use at the NOW meeting because we had to know what our vaginas looked like. And we all did it. And we took the speculums home and I had mine for probably 20 years. I don't know where it is now, but you so took me back to that place. I'm like, I know what mine looks like. Okay, I knew what it looked like 40 years ago. <laughs> Maybe not now. I don't know, it's a little grayer now. 
and uh, and then uh, Jessica Lewis was the the closing speaker in the morning, and she had definitely the coolest um, visual presentation I've seen in a long time. I said, "What is that? How did you use to do that? To do that? It had all the spinning in and out, and it was." Uh, she focused on uh, teen parents and working with teen parents to uh, prevent intimate partner violence, to work on control issues, to, um, to deal with the fact that those in those relationships they are at higher risk, significantly higher risk of intimate partner violence than in uh, adult relationships. Um, and particularly in terms of uh, where there is violence in the relationship, they have much worse health in health outcomes and much worse birth outcomes, again, um, in the cases of pregnancy. And so she talked about um, how, how you can deal with that. And I thought one of the most interesting parts was the teaching of negotiation skills and building in those skills very early on whether it was negotiating how to use a condom or negotiating who's going to change the baby's diaper next and the extent to which those uh, building in that kind of uh, negotiation skill in, in um, younger couples can make a real difference early on. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend as, quite as much time summarizing the afternoon session because you all were here already, but it um, it was, I really, having been a prosecutor myself, I can identify so much with, uh, with what Kate talked about and sometimes feeling like, even though you know in the grand scheme that you're doing the right thing, sometimes, it, um, sometimes it's difficult to do. And, um, and she made us think a lot about the boundaries between respecting the autonomy and the decisions of women who are survivors of violence and getting the abuser um, out of the home or the rapist off of the street or the trafficker out of the business of trafficking and, and how, you balance, uh, how you balance all of that. And I, I also liked her pointing out some of the occasional ignorance of judges who have no idea what a speculum is or a clitoral ring or all kinds of things that might come up in the, uh, in the process of trying to pursue these cases. Um, Elisa, your personal story, incredibly, incredibly moving and um, made me think about the time I spent as a prosecutor working, uh, working child sex abuse cases and made me think back, you know, decades ago to, to how we handled those kinds of cases and, uh, you know, whether or not there was any thought given to uh, is there is there a way to, um, to think about pre preventing abuse in families in a way that does not necessarily require incarceration, but does reform, um, does reform behavior and does restore uh, the families. And then uh, Lisa Florence um, helped us pull away the layers and pull the string. I like those terminologies of getting, you know, getting down deeper into the subject of uh, incarcerated women, particularly women who are <coughs> incarcerated because they responded to threats and violence with violence themselves. And how those women are treated, are they treated as victims or are they treated as perpetrators and I'm not sure that in our current system whether we really have it clear um, how we treat them and I mean clearly we treat them as per perpetrators but do we recognize that they're also victims and is that is that taken into account and are they treated uh, like a person who acted in self-defense which frequently is the case or at least they per perceive that they were defending themselves and defending their children and their families, and uh, whether or not the lock them up and throw away the key model is uh, is the right one to be used when women act in that way. So I would love to say thank you to all of the presenters and ask for another one more round of applause. <laughs> Such deep thoughts. What? What are you taking away from this? What are the what are what are the the gems? What are the pieces that you and I know you probably have several of them, but uh, what are you what are you taking away 
somebody put a hand up and say, here's something that I'm going to remember from today, or I'm going to think about, or I'm going to go read more about, or I'm going to look up and see, find out something about that. Presenters can participate too, because you were listening. Um, I don't think I could possibly choose one thing, yeah. um, but just as a recently graduated Smithy who has been doing like nannying, which is not very intellectually stimulating, <laughs> um, it's been really nice to like be back in a room full of Smithies and to like my brain is so full of intellectual things now, I'll be set for several months. So I'm just kind of very grateful for this. Thank you. I know I made all kinds of notes of things I'm going to go back and look up and recommendations and websites I wrote down and uh, and actually I think um, Jessica didn't you agree that you would send your slides sure, to Professor Baker and make them available mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think I started that I said can I have those slides <laughs> those are those are really good and uh, so Professor Baker will have those if anybody would like a copy of those slides. But I know that I was writing down things like crazy. Um, well, I did teach uh, things after uh, this morning as well. And um, I work in the government of uh, Massachusetts. And it's kind of nice to see a lot of different uh, reactions to violence, but also reactions to sort of like government um, yeah. policies and agencies that deal with women's rights. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just nice to see, because I feel like sometimes I get really frustrated in the job I do. So it's nice to see that it's like, that's you know, true as with so many things it helps to feel like you're not the only one yeah. it can be isolating and when you figure out there are other people going through the same thing it uh, makes you look at what you're what you're feeling in a different way can I say something just in response to sure. that really quickly is that even when you work in nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and you get funding from you know government, you're dealing with a lot of the same kind yeah, of self-censorious yeah. um, kinds of situations. So it's you're not really free from it anywhere. Oh yeah, go. no, I imagine that was just, it's just, just kind of it. interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. A couple of things, but kind of going off of that and off of, of your thesis. Of, um, I just finished my VOCA training also um, victims of crime assistance and there is actual financial compensation for victims of crime up to a maximum of $25,000. But if anyone defends themselves, like um, a, a woman who is defending herself against um, uh, domestic violence, if she is arrested and charged, she is automatically uh, disqualified from receiving any type of financial compensation as a victim, which is, to me, I just think it's horrible. You know, these women are, are in prison because they defended themselves. And now the state is saying they're not worthy as a victim, which, mm -hmm. which I think. Do they have to be convicted or just arrested and charged? Um, if, no, just, just to be, yeah, if they're in jail and yeah. have been charged. It happened they, to innocent until proven guilty. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And um, so it's just, I don't know once once the whole process is over at, if they've ever if they get to the point of being proven totally innocent. I don't know if that changes. Um, but yeah, that that I just I just did that training last week. But the other thing too is I'm um, an MSW student on leave of absence this semester and I've been toying with direct care. Do I really want to stick with strictly direct care? And I've been actually toying with um, public health, so it's kind of, yeah, <laughs> today kind of really confirmed that I've been looking at the, the BU, BU MSW public health program, which is really cool. So it's kind of, kind of sparking. Spark that. That's yeah. great. I saw a hand back there. Somebody was just fixing their hair. <laughs> oh, one thing that I liked a lot, um, thinking about um, teachers that, that uh, uh, the important takeaway was to know what you suck at really quickly <laughs> and then you can move on. Um, so That's that good. Knowing yourself is really an important part of all the journey stories that we heard today. And also that... <laughs> Thank Harry's, you, Sophie. <laughs> Harry's point about um, this whole symposium was trying to find the intersections of these two fields. And what I heard were many, many different um, intersections where 
people had located themselves in meaningful work where that was the most urgent to them. There's not the perfect job, there's not the perfect place to make change, but every place you are, if there are enough intersections there, it will unlock this um, bigger systemic problem. And, and I, that's my takeaway. It's a wonderful, wonderful observation. Thank you. I just want to elaborate on that, the, the urgency part, because that's really one of the things that brought me here. And another thing, you know, to remember, and that I remember all the time, is how privileged I am to be educated. And for me, that was something that I gave to myself and struggled to achieve. And I really feel like as educated women, we sort of have a response, not sort of, I really feel very, very urgent that we have a responsibility to do something with that. And that's one of the biggest things I learned here, um, was that education heals, education rises you above, but it also asks you something. And this is a powerful conference for me. Myself, I wasn't getting emotional, <laughs> but a very, very close friend of mine was murdered brutally in New York as a victim of domestic, domestic violence. And after three years of turmoil, I went to the uh, Supreme Court for the sentencing of this perpetrator. And it's heartbreaking to me the way that he killed her, the way that he robbed her, the way he robbed us and how little he's going to serve, really. He got 20 years for her life, and you know, with good conduct, he'll get out in 15. And I just feel like there's something really wrong with that, you know? And I need to spend the rest of my life, I've been in nursing for a really long time, and I can't do it anymore. You know, I have to do something more. So I appreciate everybody's input here. Thank it's you. been healing for me. Thank you. Um, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, I, after, after today's symposium, I feel <clears throat> like I gain more compassion that I think a lot of us lose, especially us in school, in the mundane, you know, daily life of going to class. And um, I also gain more empowerment. I think that we kind of, we hear all these bad things and we feel like we can't do anything, but, you know, if we see how many people actually care about subjects like this, that we can actually make it very true, quite true. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I am really inspired by the trajectory of all the speakers today and just everybody that I've talked to because I think like in general in a lot of um, like the communities or activists that I speak with, you know, so many of us have been through so much and still do this work. Um, and I really just wanted to do a shout out of appreciation for that. So. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful note to end on. We are only one minute over time. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Have a safe trip home.